Father, we're grateful for your word. We're grateful for the progression of the journey of the, of the spiritual life, the growth that opens up new ways of thinking and understanding about you and your plan and how we fit and what's, what's in our future and where we are today and all the things that the Spirit wants to show us. And I pray that you just give us a taste of that today and whet our appetite for more and more and more. And we ask it in Christ's name, amen. And I do ask for Steve Bryant too. Spiritual success, I don't know if you think about these things, I do. I mean, I look at my life sometimes and wonder, you know, Matthias, at the end of Acts chapter 1, Matthias was a man chosen to take the place of Judas. You know, Judas killed himself and they named the field after him and all this kind of business. And so Peter decided that they needed to replace uh, Judas, that they needed a 12th. And uh, he quoted scripture, rightly or wrongly, but anyway, they chose Matthias. So at the end of Acts chapter 1, you think, all right, here's Matthias. And I'm telling you, from that moment on, Matthias was in every high-level meeting his opinion was considered about everything that went on. Listen, you never hear from him again. His name is never mentioned again. So let's ask a question. Was he a success? I mean, spiritually, in, in God's eyes, was he a success? We don't know, do we? I mean, that, I mean he might have walked out of that meeting that day and went, you guys are nuts. <laughs> I mean, you guys are, you're, you're bucking the Sanhedrin. I'm going to go anyway. Who knows? But, so, I look at my life, and I think, you know, how do I measure? How do I measure my life? How do I measure? I mean, I'm on the latter end of it, and... I realize, I mean, it could be that this would be my last day, but anyway, I realize that, that each of us does this, whether we know it or not, we evaluate ourselves often in relation or in comparison to other people. That's how the world does it. The world looks at success or less than success based on comparing with other people. How many sermons have I preached? How many people have gotten saved, et cetera? Is that the measure of success? I mean, how many people have you preached? If that's the measure of success, some of you are in deep trouble because you never have preached a sermon, right? So it can't be that, huh? So <clears throat> man was designed to work. We're designed to be doers. Listen, e even... Before the fall in the garden, Adam had a job. He was a doer. So it's not that we're not supposed to work and accomplish visible things. It's not that we don't do that. We're designed for that. That can't be the measure of success. Who is able to pile up the most dollar bills before they leave? That can't be it. Who's able to preach the most sermons? Can't be it. Can't be it. Because I believe God offers each of us the opportunity to be successful in the sphere in which he has assigned us and given us. Whatever that sphere is, whatever your niche is, someone said success is Total utilization of assets given. Making the most out of what you have. Not how much you have and not how far you get with it. It's making the most out of what you have. I'm reminded as I'm speaking of uh, Frank. Y'all remember Frank in the wheelchair? I mean, that guy... He was an irritating 
difficult person to be around. But I'd pull up to the church, and Frank would be headed to Walmart. He can only reach to the ground with one foot, but that one foot would be pushing himself backward in that wheelchair. And I, I would just think, what determine, what grit must be in a person or, or, or I don't know. I wondered sometimes if he was an alcoholic and he wasn't headed for the beer, you know, but uh, who knows? But here's what he was given. Here's what he was given. Did he make the most of it? I don't know. After the fall, we're still to till the ground. The woman was to bear children. It's easy to think of our life as something that we do. And to think of ourselves as human doings, we judge ourselves based on what we've gotten done today. If you're a list checker, your success is how far you got on your list. Now, the question is, is God, does God have the same list? We falsely consider success to be what we're able to pike up, I said, but actually pile up and what we visibly accomplish. So, the world measures success comparing and accomplishments. And I've given a whole bunch of things here. I don't want to focus on this part. I just These are things that if you need to look at this and think, if this is your idea of success, I would encourage you to challenge these ideas. Wealth, respect, fame, some people think if they don't get married, they're a failure. Nobody wanted me. Yeah, family. There are women that feel lesser if their bodies are unable to reproduce a child. If they don't have the privilege. Education. This was one that I had for a while because I had a sister who had a master's degree, and I told her she died at quite a few years ago, but I already always told her that I was going to beat her. And, and, and finally, accomplishments. Now, thirdly, Jesus, whatever success is, Jesus was and is the epitome of it. Would you agree with that? Jesus is, is the pinnacle of it. All right, we know that. So nowhere do we see Jesus pursuing any of the traditional methods of success. Now, he was born with a unique and specific mission, so you could say, well, look, he knew he was going to only live to 30-something, and so he did pursue a retirement program. He knew he didn't need a re His retirement program was in heaven. Well, so was yours. Yours is too. So he didn't pursue any of these things. He didn't waste one minute of his life pursuing those things that mattered less than those that mattered most. He spent his life, he understood what mattered most. And, and listen, he never got sidetracked He's the most amazing human to ever live because he never thought a wrong thought. Stuff would come in his head and he would go, I don't think so. See, he truly was free to look at old man type worldly thinking and go, no. Problem with us is we're born into that and before we really know what's happened or have a chance to get a grip on it, we've bought into a bunch of it and already programmed ourselves to think that way. So you get saved and you wake up to the spiritual life and you're already ingrained with that stuff. You have to work it out to get rid of it. You have to get rid of it to replace it. So he never did that. So he never had any of the old, the wrong, the false thinking that entrenched his soul. Never had that. 
Isn't that amazing? It's pretty different than you and I. The problem with you and I, see, we, we're born into that. We osmose it. We pick it up and we ingrain it and we operate on it and we habituate it. And it's the thing that continues to be the bugaboo. It's what you have to get rid of. Now, he remained single. He was a construction worker. I don't think he was whistling at the women going by, you know, that, but who knows? When he died, he only owned the clothes on his back. Boy, he was a bum, wasn't he? Homeless. Literally. Homeless. He remained private and obscure until the Father promoted him for the world to see. He was focused on the Father and the Spirit from birth, spiritually advanced by age 12, successfully resisted every scheme of the devil, obeyed the Father at every single moment of his human existence, maxed out his spiritual maturity at age 30, surrendered himself to be tortured, endured the cross to pay for the sins of the world, experienced death and the resurrection. Sits in heaven today, is the head of the church, savior of the body, you and I are our best friend, our Lord, our master, our king. What a guy. Total surrender and obedience to the Father resulted in the greatest promotion in history from the greatest depths to the greatest promotion. He never fought that. Listen, as I consider greatness in the spiritual life, I realize that it may involve great suffering. It's been given to believe and to suffer. And that in the advanced stages of the spiritual life, if the Lord allows the devil to take shots at you so that you can prove out the power of grace and truth, then you're going to go through some stuff. And you know, you wonder, will you fight that? Will you struggle against that? I see our nation being challenged, people trying to take us under, literally. The whole freedom system has been, I don't know, it's been propagandized against and people are trying to change it into a whole system of control and slavery. That's the goal. Now, do you fight that? Do you just accept it? Do you surrender to it and go, Father, whatever your will? No, I, I don't. But fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter, finisher of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Now, I'm not going to try to define success. I think it's basically faithfulness to the very end. But it's more than that. But faithfulness is a really kind of a simple look at it. I want to talk about the basic ingredients, the, the journey. I want to lay out the journey as I see it. I think the Bible is, first, you've got to have a relationship with the Spirit. So many people that I know Christians don't have a relationship with the Spirit. They know about the Spirit, they believe in the Spirit, but they don't hear the Spirit and they don't listen to the Spirit. They don't, they can't hear Him. They can't sense Him. And you go, well, that, He's talking about me. I don't. You're, you're missing something. You're missing the real essence of this thing. So, the indwelling, the filling, the walking in the Spirit, the enlightenment of the Spirit, the empowerment of the Spirit, His leading and guiding in your life, producing the fruits. He empowers us to develop the mindsets of love, joy, peace, and patience. So, Spirit, part of success. Then there's Shema, it means to hear. Hear, O Israel. And the word akuo in the Greek literally means to listen, to listen, to be teachable, to be humble enough to say, I don't know. Question for all of us great advanced 
students of the word, at what point can you no longer be challenged or corrected? At what point have you got it so together? And I'm asking myself, because I think I do have it together, and I don't know that my life proves that out. Thirdly, spiritual growth. Ephesians 4, 11 through 16 talks about reaching the, the stature of the measure, the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ unto a mature man. Talks about believers speaking truth to one another so that we may grow into this relationship with the Father, and I mean with the Son who takes us to the Father. The stages, the brephos, the napios, the pice, the technon, the quios, adult son, and then once you're in an adult level of, of understanding, then, the, then you move to maturity. <laughs> I've got a 19-year-old and a 20-year-old still living at home, and they are, quote, adults, but they're far from mature. So then there's purification. This is the removal of previous programming from the demonic and cosmic system. It's a belief system that we initially uh, ingrained in our heart, habituated and turned into our sub, what we call the subconscious. It's just habits. Subconscious is nothing more than habits. Now, it is more than this, but it's primarily habits of thinking in, in patterns that you no longer are aware of. You've done it so many times, it's such an automatic reaction, you don't even see it happening. But listen, it's all choice. Just because you don't see yourself choosing something doesn't mean that you didn't choose it. You chose it. You're responsible for it. You go, well, gosh, look, here's what's great about knowing that. If you're choosing your unconscious thoughts and behavior that are producing negative results in your life, you can also become aware of that and choose differently. Choose differently so that you produce results in keeping with God's will. That'd be nice, wouldn't it? Yep. It's a programming issue got to recognize the false stuff in our life, the images in the, in the inner dialogue. Listen, thinking is, is produced by inner images, the eyes of the heart, and inner dialogue. That's what that is. Now, you can connect your inner images and your inner dialogue to the cosmic system, the devil's world, the demonic thinking. You can connect it and in, ingrain it in that so that all you habitually see in your mind and say to yourself is lies. That's what's got to be broken. Or you can choose, now that you're saved and free and have the Spirit, you can choose to take these images, Ephesians 1, 18 through 22, the, he says, I want you to visualize with the eyes of your heart, the Spirit's going to give you light to see the hope of his calling, the inheritance he has, and the power that I put in you. We're to see that and tell ourselves about that. See, you choose. Most of us just let this run on automatic, and it's not a good thing. So you develop the new man, which is based on principles and concepts of the thinking of Christ. You develop that to live this out. You develop love and intimacy with God, which is the real, listen, I'm a, I, my gripe with preachers is to tell you what to do and not ever tell you how to do it. That's my gripe. Here's what you should be. Here's how you should behave. And you go, well, I don't, I don't be anything like that and I don't behave like that. How do I get that to happen? How do I get there? That's what categories produce, give to you. That's why categories are necessary because you can see the mechanics. How does this work? These things I've been talking about are the mechanics of getting to this place 
But the real goal is to get to a place of love and intimacy with the Lord. Now, you can have a form of love and intimacy with the Lord in a very simple way without a lot of doctrine, without a lot of information, without developing and growing and insights and understanding and laying stuff aside and putting stuff on. You can have, but listen, down the road of the developed life, man, it gets rich. It gets real. So that when you're standing here and you know that God is with you and you and he both are looking out on the situation of your life and you're starting to be able to see it from his perspective and you know that he loves you and wants the best for you and he's with you and he's not ever going to leave you, it's like, wow, wow. That's why you grow. You don't get that as a baby. As a baby or even as a young adult, all the worldly stuff that you've let in your life, the hooks still are just so loud, it drowns everything out. It drowns the spirit out. We're so focused on the things and trying to get ahead and trying to pay the bills and fearful and wondering, oh, if the church moves, what will I do? Well, you do you have a car? I don't, mean to, I don't mean to make light of that. I'm not making light of it. Love and intimacy, intimacy with God is the goal. So it's a, it's a primary goal to be able to sense him, to feel him, to hear his voice, to see what he's showing you. But to do that, listen, you got to be filled with the Spirit. You can't be habitually sinning, and you have to listen. You have to believe that he's inside of you. You have to believe that he's speaking to you, and you have to listen. I've gotten to a point where now most every t- if I'm in my right mind, which sometimes, every now and then I, everything clicks and I'm in my right mind, that before I speak, I'll listen. Slow to speak, quick to listen. Listen. What is he saying? You know, I used to call it my gut. What is my gut telling me? And maybe as just a baby believer, that was my gut. But now it's the spirit. The spirit's saying, hmm. And I get a, no, I don't know. I don't think so. And I let it alone. No. No, then it's like, okay, I like that. That feels right. My gut says good, that's good. I'm just sharing you my life. Then out of that comes the virtue, love for all mankind. And that's the evidence. Christ said our love for one another, this kind of love, this patient love, this enduring love, this forbearing love, that doesn't react, that doesn't get hurt at people and angry at people, that understands that everybody's struggling to do better, that that love, that's what proves to the world that Jesus is real. That's what he said. When they see that, they'll know that I'm for real. I'm a real person. That's the evidence now, I don't see a lot of that in our world today. I mean, I don't, sometimes I don't see it in me. I struggle with how do I fight against the evil that's trying to destroy my nation and yet love at the same time. Finally, victory. Uh, it's different views on what the angelic conflict is about. But you reach a place of maturity where God allows us to be confronted by the forces of evil that seek to discredit and destroy us, and we're able to stand firm on the promises and the principles and the rationales of the Word of God, and we're able to stand firm in faith and trust those things no matter what the world does around you, no matter what your mate does, your children, the finances, the economy. It's all great to have a great economy. Those are all good things. Not success, though. 
It's just a stage in which we live out our life. God will call us to the witness stand in the courtroom of the angelic conflict, and we get to witness for his grace, his power, his mercy, which, listen, I personally believe was available to the fallen angels. I don't have proof of that in the scriptures, but I believe that because it's God's essence, it's God's character, that he offered them the same thing that he offered me. And that as I surrender myself to God's plan, his, listen, God's plan is not, God's plan is to make me into greatness of humility and faith and confidence. As I surrender to that, I prove out what everybody in the existence could have had, could still have. The devil says, take away everything like you did me, and Job will curse you like I did. So he's justifying himself. God says, okay, let's see. Let's put it to the test. What did Job do? Hey, Job was frantic. Job was a mess. Job went all over the place, but let me tell you, he never turned against God. He struggled with it the whole way. He hollered, I need my Redeemer. I will come and justify all this. But he always trusted God through it all, knowing God would redeem him, that God, God loved him. So Matthew 25 talks about the parable of the tenants. Those who've made the most, and he talks about the five talents, the two talents and the one. The guy who had five got five more. He invested his life. He took what God gave him and he invested it in his life and it produced more. Same with the two. Then the guy that had one didn't have the same abilities or capacities or the same opportunities as these, but he had it. Instead of making the most out of his life, spiritually speaking, he just sat on it. He just sat on it. The Lord said, take what little he's got. This seems odd. Take what little he's got and give it to the guy that has the most. So, interesting way of turning out. But what he told the other two, this is what you want to hear. Well done, good and faithful servant. That's what you want to hear. Let's close in prayer, and then, Rick, if you'll lead us out. Well, Father, I pray that these things make sense and that we're able to sort of visualize this path, this journey we're on, where it's heading, the different aspects and mechanics of it, and the journey's goal and destination. I pray that we have the courage to walk this, Father, to, to take this road the way it was called toward you to intimacy and love and where our every thought comes into captivity to Jesus Christ. I pray that for each of us, Father, and I pray it in Christ's name. Amen.